The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Chapter 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Edited by Frank Woodworth Pine. Chapter 5. Early Friends in Philadelphia. Keimer and I lived on a pretty good familiar footing, and agreed tolerably well, for he suspected nothing of my setting up. He retained a great deal of his old enthusiasms, and loved argumentation. We, therefore, had many disputations. I used to work him so with my Socratic method, and I had trepanned him so often by questions apparently so distant from any point he had in hand, and yet by degrees led to the point and brought him into difficulties and contradictions that at last he grew ridiculously cautious and would hardly answer me the most common question without asking first what do you intend to make from that however it gave him so high an opinion of my abilities in the confuting way that he seriously proposed my being his colleague in the project he had of setting up a new sect he was to preach the doctrines, and I was to confound all opponents. When he came to explain with me upon the doctrines, I found several conundrums, which I objected to, unless I might have my way a little too, and introduce some of mine. Keimer wore his beard at full length, because somewhere in the Mosaic law it is said, Thou shalt not mar the corners of thy beard. He likewise kept the seventh-day Sabbath, and these two points were essential to him. I disliked both, but agreed to admit them upon condition of his adopting the doctrine of using no animal food. I doubt, said he, my constitution will not bear that. I assured him it would, and that he would be better for it. He was usually a great glutton, and I promised myself some diversion in half-starving him. He agreed to try the practice, if I would keep him company. I did so, and we held it for three months. We had our victuals dressed and brought to us regularly by a woman in the neighborhood, who had from me a list of forty dishes to be prepared for us at different times, in all which there were neither fish, flesh, nor fowl. The whim suited me the better at this time, from the cheapness of it, not costing us above eighteen pence sterling each week. I have since kept several lents most strictly, leaving the common diet for that, and that for the common, abruptly, without the least inconvenience, so that I think there is a little in the advice of making those changes by easy gradations. I went on pleasantly, but poor Keemer suffered grievously, tired of the project, longed for the flesh-pots of Egypt, and ordered a roast pig. He invited me and two women friends to dine with him, but it being brought too soon upon table, he could not resist the temptation, and ate the whole before we came. I made some courtship during this time to Miss Reed. I had a great respect and affection for her, and had some reason to believe she had the same for me. But, as I was about to take a long voyage, and we were both very young, only a little above eighteen, it was thought most prudent by her mother to prevent our going too far at present, as a marriage, if it was to take place, would be more convenient after my return, when I should be, as I expected, set up in my business. Perhaps, too, she thought my expectations not so well founded as I imagined them to be. My chief acquaintances at this time were Charles Osborne, Joseph Watson, and James Ralph, all lovers of reading. The two first were clerks in an eminent scrivener, or conveyancer in the town, Charles Brockton. The other was clerk to a merchant. Watson was a pious, sensible young man of great integrity. The others rather more lax in their principles of religion, particularly Ralph, who, as well as Collins, had been unsettled by me, for which they both made me suffer. Osborne was sensible, candid, frank, sincere, and affectionate to his friends, but, in literary matters, too fond of criticizing. Ralph was ingenious, genteel in his manners, and extremely eloquent. I think I never knew a prettier talker. 
Both of them were great admirers of poetry, and began to try their hands in little pieces. Many pleasant walks we four had together on Sundays into the woods near Shukil, where we read to one another and conferred on what we read. Ralph was inclined to pursue the study of poetry, not doubting, but he might become eminent in it and make his fortune by it, alleging that the best poets must, when they first begin to write, make as many faults as he did. Osborne dissuaded him, assured him he had no genius for poetry, and advised him to think of nothing beyond the business he was bred to, that, in the mercantile way, though he had no stock, he might, by his diligence and punctuality, recommend himself to employment as a factor, and in time acquire wherewith to trade on his own account. I approved the amusing one's self with poetry now and then, so far as to improve one's language, but no farther. On this it was proposed that we should each of us, at our next meeting, produce a piece of our own composing, in order to improve by our mutual observations, criticisms, and corrections. As language and expression were what we had in view, we excluded all considerations of invention by agreeing that the task should be a version of the eighteenth psalm, which describes the descent of a deity. When the time of our meeting drew nigh, Ralph called on me first, and let me know his piece was ready. I told him I had been busy, and having little inclination, had done nothing. He then showed me his piece for my opinion, and I much approved it, as it appeared to me to have great merit. Now, says he, Osborne never will allow the least merit in anything of mine, but makes one thousand criticisms out of mere envy. He is not so jealous of you. I wish, therefore, you would take this piece and produce it as yours. I will pretend not to have had time, and so produce nothing. We shall then see what he will say to it. It was agreed, and I immediately transcribed it, that it might appear to be in my own hand. We met, Watson's performance was read, there was some beauties in it, but many defects. Osborne's was read, it was much better. Ralph did it justice, remarked some faults, but applauded the beauties. He himself had nothing to produce. I was backward, seemed desirous of being excused, and had not sufficient time to correct, etc. But no excuse could be admitted. Produce I must. I was read and repeated. Watson and Osborne gave up the contest, and joined in applauding it. Ralph only made some criticism and proposed some amendments, but I defended my text. Osborne was against Ralph, and told him he was no better a critic than poet, so he dropped the argument. As they two went home together, Osborne expressed himself still more strongly, in favour of what he thought my production. Having restrained himself before, as he said, lest I should think it flattery, but who would have imagined, said he, that Franklin had been capable of such a performance, such panting, such force, such fire? He has even improved the original. In his common conversation he seems to have no choice of words. He hesitates and blunders, and yet, good God, how he writes. When we next met, Ralph discovered the trick we had played on him, and Osborne was a little laughed at. This transaction fixed Ralph in his resolution of becoming a poet. I did all that I could to dissuade him from it, but he continued scribbling verses till Pope cured him. Begin footnote. In one of the later editions of the Duncanade occur the following lines. Silence ye wolves, where Ralph to Cynthia howls, and makes night hideous, answer him ye owls. To this the poet adds the following note. James Ralph, a name inserted after the first editions, not known until he writ a swearing piece called Swaney, very abusive of Dr. Swift, Mr. Gay, and myself. End footnote. He became, however, a pretty good prose writer. More of him hereafter. But as I may not have occasion again to mention the other two, I shall just remark here that Watson died in my arms a few years after, much lamented being the best of our set. Osborne went to the West Indies, where he became an eminent lawyer, and made money, but died young. He and I made a serious agreement that the one who happened first to die should, if possible, make a friendly visit to the other, and acquaint him of how he found things in that separate state. But he never fulfilled his promise. 
End of chapter 5